This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show here at NAMM 2014, and I'm here with bass player Marco Mendoza. Marco, how are you enjoying the NAMM? I'm really good, Eric. Thanks for asking me to do this. I'm having a blast. This is Saturday night. For me, it's the end of all my commitments. I've been here since Thursday. And uh, needless to say, I don't want to tell you my schedule, what it was like, but uh, I just to say I have a lot of support from all the companies I work with, which is Samson, Harky, uh, you know, Diodario, Strings, and uh, now I just joined the ESP family recently. Well, nice. about a year now. And so, a great bunch of cats, family, friends, and being that I live here in California and not too far from here, Orange County, um, you know, they call on me and say, can you do this? And I said, of course, man, you know, so you take care of business. NAMM show for me is, you know, it happens once a year. It's all about the community, the music business. And when you've been around as long as I have, I know a lot of folks and all my friends are here. It's kind of homecoming, you know, and you get to say hello to everybody. Even though people move around in the companies, yeah, I have long standing relationships with a lot of cats. So it's really fun for me, man. And then, uh, you know, and then you get to play and flex your muscle a little bit and have fun. So it's good. I look forward to it. Tell me your first big band. My first big band, uh, gosh, uh, I was under the influence of a lot of stuff, man. And I have to bring this up because um, last September 20th, I, I got sober in 87. I celebrated, obviously, 26 years of sobriety. And I did a lot of things that were off the radar. A lot of great bands that, that uh, came from Mexico and they were national um, acts and we were touring and doing arenas and all that, but it was all that market. When I came uh, to the U.S., I played with anybody and everybody for the longest time, but when I got sober, it's what I decide in the way I, I'm thinking today. When I got sober is when my career started. That's when I was really ready to play ball, to do what it, you know, what I had to do to take care of business, dedicate myself, and so my one of my first breaks was Bill Ward, Bill Bill Ward from Black Sabbath. He was doing a solo, his first solo project, which was which ended up uh, Ward One, I think it was the name of the album. I'm trying to remember, but I met him through recovery and sobriety. Funny enough, and so my my career kind of took off from there. Um, ended up doing a few gigs with Edgar Winter, I did some studio work with Al Jarreau, uh, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of stuff, more than I can remember, to be honest. But then John Sykes was looking for me to uh, replace Tony Franklin on the second Blue Murder album. And that got me on the map even bigger. It was a Geffen album, so we started touring. Uh, so there's a few things that happened along the way. And then he was my connection with Thin Lizzy in 94 and uh, the point of this whole thing is that you know I started showing up I stopped drinking I start I stopped goofing around with the drugs and uh, I took uh, you know pride in what, who I was and what I was doing and, and what a privilege it is to be in this business because it is and to celebrate music and life to the fullest and show up on time and know your shit and so that's when start it started moving for me but I've done a lot of stuff man I, uh, uh, it's been I've been reminded of how many albums I've been you know part of and it's it's amazing because for me I'm just beginning I'm I'm ready for more I'm like give, come on let's go you know so yeah. I'm excited and You're then healthy. I'm very healthy thank God man uh, and uh, and the Nam show does that for me too it kind of it brings it all home it puts everything in perspective you know what a privilege it is to be in this business that's the bottom line for me. It's, it's what it is, you know, we're very lucky. There's talent involved, but you know, meeting the right people at the right time and doing the right things is a big factor, you know, for those up and coming players, you know, and to have all the tools that you need in your toolbox to, you know, to throw down when you have to and take care of business. So it's, uh, it's cool. So my first break, first big band, I would say Bill Ward, you know, that was a big, big project. Uh, up until that point, I'd done a few gigs here and there, but nothing, uh, nothing big enough. I, you know, I think I played with Edgar there a couple of times. You were in White Snake. I was in White Snake for a while. I worked. Uh, I got to meet David uh, back in '96, '97. I want to say, maybe yes. Yeah. Bro. Oh no, he's the ultimate. Yeah. He is the ultimate cat man. He, uh, you know, there's only one. David Coverdale. Yeah. 
and there's never going to be another one. And uh, and so I got to uh, experience that firsthand. And uh, he's a true artist. He's a very, very, very um, what's the word? Passionate about the business and what he does and his music and his voice and everything. And and he's an, he was an inspiration to me actually in a big way. And I got to do his first solo album. Not this first. It was uh, Into the Light. Uh, very bluesy. Yes, very bluesy, stripped down a little yeah. bit. I love that album. To this day, I hear the tracks here and there. But got to hang with one of my favorite lineups to hang out with, you know, Red Beach and Tommy Aldrich and Doug Aldrich, uh, Doug Aldrich, Timothy, Timothy Drury. I left Whitesnake to work with Lissy, and I did, I came across Neil Sean at NAMM. And he called me, and uh, he says, I've heard a lot about you, man. I want you, you know, I'm doing some music. I'm doing a... A project, a band, and you got to play. I, you come highly recommended. Soul I said, "Well, circus. Soul Circus." Funny enough, funny enough, it was at Nam, and I said, "Well, where can I hear you?" What? I said, "Bro, I'm going to be on stage in 15 minutes. Come!" And he saw me play with the Santana Boys, and and uh, and we had a blast. He said, "Wow!" He called me right after I got off stage. And the next thing you know, two, three weeks later, we were in the studio with Jeff Scott Soto, Dean Casanova, and uh, Neil and myself, and we worked for two days. We got six, seven tracks done. Another, excuse me, two, three weeks went by. We got together for another two days and the album was done. And uh, great band, man. We had a blast. Soul Circus, you know, to that this day. Is, that, that album is amazing. Every song on there is amazing, Absolutely. packed with great musicianship, Absolutely. ripping leads, yeah. great vocals. The yeah. production is amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Great experience. Unfortunately, it didn't go as far as I would have hoped it, it would have. You know, but everybody's busy doing other things. And, but it's definitely something to go to. You know, you want to go hear that album whenever you can, and it's it's inspirational. I just spoke with Neil a little bit ago, actually. Yeah, he just got married. Congratulations, yeah, bro. Yeah, did. Lots of love and respect. You know, I love you, man. Always. And uh, yeah, we have another album in the can. Speaking of, uh, circus record. Uh, no, it'll be a Neil Sean project. Okay. From what I know, things could change. Again, talk to me next week. We'll. It's always ever-changing and ongoing, but uh, Dean Casanova, uh, Neil, and myself, we got it together. And is Neil going to sing? Neil is singing, okay. which is great. Yeah, he's got a great voice. Yes, yes. And um, and Dean. Yeah, no. Oh he's my a monster, and he can sing too. Oh like, my, awesome. Oh, my gosh, bro. I, you know. And then I got to sing a little bit, and we had a blast. No pressure, just going in the studio, being creative. And Neil at the helm, directing the boat, the ship, and we all go, and it boom, 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 done. Next. The way it should be, if you ask me. I'm, I'm old school when it comes to that. You know, Music is a moment. A moment, boom. Absolutely. When we start focusing too much on the production and, and, and polishing something too much, it kind of... You get rid of the essence, so the the magic that happened that minute, you know. And that's my, you know, that's another book. No, but that's uh, true. you exhaust it if you keep on doing it over and over again. You catch, you lose that original spark. Absolutely, it becomes, for me, the the, the initial passes on any track is in instinct. You're playing on instinct. Now that you got familiar with this stuff, now you're in the head. Now you're thinking, and once my brain gets involved. Hello. <laughs> so it changes. Yeah, the, 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 the chemistry there, like you said, it, is, it changes. But uh, so, yeah, so we have that, that little album coming out hopefully soon. Um, I've been involved with uh, Thin Lissy, like I said, since 94. And we've been working a lot in the past three years. And we got to the point where we wanted to do new music. And the estate was behind it, and Scott and Brian and uh, Nuclear Blast, the label, was behind it. And then got to the point where it just didn't feel right moving forward without Phil. Uh, you, have, Phil. you have a band, though. It's the guys, the Thin Lizzy guys, but you have a different name. Yes, it's called uh, Black Star Riders. And uh, the album is All Hell Breaks Loose. And we just did our first official run uh, all over Europe and the UK and Ireland, a complete success. There's a buzz out there. Uh, funny enough, I'm driving around LA and I hear the tracks here and there. It's, it's very cool. And it's very much inspired by Thin Lizzy and what Phil used to do with the boys, with Gary and, uh, and Scott and, and Brian and all that. Um, so uh, you can hear, you can hear the vibe, the Lizzy vibe, because 
we've been flying that flag, you yeah. know, for three years. So um, Damon and Reiki started writing uh, based on where we were going. And so the essence of it all is then Lizzie, but then we took the name away. We threw that out of the equation and Black Star Writers and now we're representing what we're doing and it allows us to write new music. You know, so uh, it's it's been a blast, man. A great ride. I've watched you guys play live on Palladia. Uh -huh. Those big festivals, you, you're having a blast oh, out well. there. Bro, uh, you know, doing interviews, I have to say, that's my favorite place to be in the whole wide world, man, is on stage, on any stage with any band, music. Uh, I, I've become addicted to it. Besides being at home with my kids and my wife, I love spending time there too, but I, they know that I'm addicted to what I do, so I have a blast, yeah. Especially, I think, I want to say that was High Voltage and or, uh, uh, what was it, Download? Yeah. Or both or something. These are massive festivals, man. And the vibe is just insane. Every the energy. Kid is singing every lyric to every song, and you can hear them. So how can you not yeah. feel the energy? You know, and like I said before, man, I don't take anything that's mind-altering. I'm right there, feeling the energy, man, and the power of what music and rock and roll is, and having an audience of that size. It's like, you know, that's my high. That's my buzz. So I'm having a blast. We were all having a blast. How did you feel when you were first asked to be the bass player in Thin Lizzy, and you, and you thought about Phil's legacy? I was one of those guys, bro, that for some reason I knew about Thin Lizzy, I loved the songs, but I knew very little. Because if you remember that when they came to the States, uh, something happened, let's just say whatever happened and they just didn't manage to finish the tours and this and that. Uh, so I knew about Thin Lizzy, of course, the boys, the big songs, you know, the four or five big songs, you know, the boys are back, jailbreak, uh, uh, maybe whiskey, uh, still in love with you, the big anthems. And uh, working with John Sykes, he kind of introduced me to a lot of the deeper cuts from Thunder and Lightning, which is Thunder and oh, Lightning, Cold Sweat, yeah. you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So I started getting into it a little bit more. In 94, we were touring with Blue Murder in Japan, and uh, Udo, brother, all right, um, Udo, um, you know, one of the biggest promoters in Japan so at the time was a big fan of Lizzie and Phil's and John's and and we were touring with Blue Murder and he has this uh, 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 historical dinner that he does. It's part of what he does at the end of any tour. He'll have you come and do the the Kobe beef thing and it's very cool. It's a ritual that he does and so it's, it's very cool to be there. Anyway, um, he started talking about, you know, how the boys, have you stayed in touch with Scott and Brian and Darren and, and John said, yeah, we talk, you know, we stay in touch. He says, well, what do you think about doing something to pay tribute to Phil, you know? And, and John said, I remember the conversation. He says, yeah, of course, I'll give everybody a call and we'll see. And it was left at that. I think a few months later, I get the call from John Sykes saying, uh, you know, it looks like it's moving forward. Like we're going to do seven or eight shows in Japan and uh, we're going to pay tribute to Phil, it's going to be the Lissy set, and the boys, everybody's in, uh, and they're coming to L.A., so I threw your name in, in the mix, and they want to meet you, they want to hear you play and all that, and so uh, um, Scott Gorham talks about this because John brought him to one of my jazz gigs. To this day, I almost lost the gig <laughs> because <laughs> because I'm, I think it was Lavalier or Baked Potato it's here in L.A. <laughs> yeah, I've got a six-string fretless bass, yeah. <laughs> and I'm playing a lot of notes. I'm having a blast, and it's great music. It is for me still. And uh, but Scott went, oh no! Can this so, guy groove? <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, yeah, fortunately, you know, like I said, man, I, I'd like to take my, what I do very seriously and I put my time in when I need to. I love to do homework. I still have that thing where I love to learn stuff and I'm always learning. And uh, so I did my homework. I think I learned by three, you know, 23, 22 tracks, the top, you know, and uh, went through a lot of the sets that they used to do. So I said, well, pretty much I knew which ones they were going to go for. But so, yeah, I showed up. Hit it off with Scott Gorham right away. He's a California dude, you know. And hit it off with Darren and and John was cool. Brian was still the drummer. He's standoffish, checking me out, you know. 
I'm all tatted up and I got piercings all over the place and who is this cat, you know, and he's seen all the jazz stuff. So, um, fortunately, I, I know, you know, having been around for a few years, I know what to bring, what tools to bring to certain uh, situations. I'd like to think so. Mm -hmm. And so I brought my pick, I brought my four string uh, P bass, and I laid it down and I did my homework and they would throw a track at me and I would play it. And then they they would bring a, a you know an obscure one to see, let's see if we could, you know, stomp him or whatever. And there it was and there it was. I did. I made a few notes, a few charts on a couple that I wasn't very sure on, just to make sure. And long story short, I got the gig. After playing around for a couple hours or an hour, Scott came to me and says, "Well, you want to come to Japan, man?" I said, "Yes, sign me up." So that was the beginning of a long relationship. That was in '94. I was just talking to Scott a few months ago in in England, and him and I are, you know, we come from the same place, man. I'm a big fan of his plan. Uh, Scott Gorham sounds like Scott Gorham. Whatever he does is part of Thin Lizzy, the essence, in my opinion. Uh, so we have a great time, man. And now we're, we've got this new endeavor, this new project together, and with Damon Johnson, who is unbelievable, and Ricky Warwick uh, at the helm, and then Jimmy DeGrasso kicking. So we're having a blast. We went out and did our, our first official thing, and, and we are including Lissy tracks. We have one album. We just got the news that we got picked up for the second album. And so hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll start putting emphasis on the new stuff and still play some of the classic stuff, but uh, breaking new ground, challenging yourself, you know. And let's talk about, let's go back to the sobriety. Yes, uh, So, you. So in 1987, yes. you, you, you get sober. Yes. What was what was what was hitting bottom? Um, the first time was 1986. For me, I got to the point where I had lost all respect for myself. I won't get into the details, but everything that that that's involved there. Uh, no, I want to say low self-esteem, but there was no self-esteem, none whatsoever. I was just pretty much existing to medicate myself, without getting into all the details. So my daily routine consisted of coming to and get my hands on anything I could medicate myself so I could get out of my skin and you can't I found out later but <coughs> I had had a little bit of success a little bit of work um, I kind of got on the radar a little bit and uh, and then I couldn't handle the the pressure and I couldn't handle life and a couple of divorces and kids and and, and life happening before me and I didn't have the tools to deal with life and so I ran through drugs and alcohol, medication, and it got to the point where it was pretty manic, man. It was, it was very dark. I, I don't know how I came out of that, to be honest. Uh, there's a small percentage of people that come out of heroin addiction, uh, they make it this far. And so I am, uh, uh, I am a freaking miracle, we like to say, you know. So that's where my passion comes from. Am I excited about playing music? Are you kidding me? Yeah, of so course. So that's part of it. But I got to the place where physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically bankrupt, I, had, I was just a blob. And uh, got to the point where I was walking the streets, talking to the wind. And I can talk about that today. I hadn't played music in months. Uh, it got really bad. One of those valleys, you know. And my sister, Linda, who I love dearly, and I love all my brothers and sisters, but she, she, her and I have been very close. She heard something through the grapevine, something was going on, and she came out and got me and convinced me to go to a treatment place here in Orange County. And I went in there and, uh, and I said all the right things. I acted the right way, a 12-step program. And I was in there for 30 days, detox. And I came out and I lasted eight and a half months because I wasn't ready. I did it for everybody else. The second time around, I got busted. I got thrown into uh, Orange County co County Jail um, uh, without getting into details. I was doing a lot of bad stuff out there with guns and stuff, you know, hooked up with the wrong people. I could talk about it today, you know. But uh, th that time I finally, in the cell in, at Orange County Jail, I got on my knees and I asked for help and I surrendered. It's a big word in this business of uh, sobriety. You talk to God. 
you surrender, you talk to God, you say, I can't do it, help me. That's the first step. The first step is you, you admit to yourself that you have a problem. It's a big one. The second one is to realize that I can't do it. I need help. And the third step is to give it up on a daily basis, hourly basis, sometimes every minute. Help me, help me, help me. And that's, that was the beginning. When I surrendered, that was the beginning of my sobriety. And that's when, when you asked me that question, that's when my career started. That's when my life started. And it's a rebirth of sorts, you know. But uh, funny enough, at dinner we were talking about, come on, have a glass of red wine. It's a beautiful, we're having a beautiful dinner. And I'm like, well, you know, <clears throat> I would love to, but I don't have that privilege anymore, and I'm fine without it. And if they want to know more, I said, well, we're going to have to talk for a couple hours because it's pretty deep here. But my sobriety is everything to me today. I protect it like I protect my kids, my child, my family, my wife. It's, you know, with heart and soul and spirit because without sobriety today, I might as well just call it a day and say, well, you know, I had a good run, see ya, and bail. So I'm not ready to do that. I still have a, lit, a little bit to do here, you know, so well, that's well, what happened, bro. The kids, the wife, I think when you grow up, you find out that those are the things that really matter in yes, life. Absolutely. And, and if you're not present, you're missing out. Yes. And, and I, the, the next thing I want to ask you is, do you feel that there was a whole... A sh something, a, something, a hole you needed to fill in your heart, and that's what led you to drugs. You were too young when the success happened, yes. and you couldn't handle it. Yes, I started touring. I got picked up at 16 years old with this national band, uh, and uh, we started touring. And along with that comes the success, and the, you, you know, you're noticed, and you start thinking you're something, and somebody, and the money, and this, and that, right. and all the little toys that you don't know how to deal with. There's no manuals written for rock and roll or being a touring musician. Like there's no manners to, to, to be a, a parent, you know what I'm saying? It's all instinct, you go by freaking, you've got a compass and you got a map and you're trying to do the best, trying to feel your way through. So yeah, I was very uh, uh, immature, not ready for what I saw coming and it hit me hard. And yeah, and then you have all these things available, you know, to medicate yourself, free, tons of it. To this day, I mean, you know, and everybody, people, everybody's your friend. Everybody's my friend, and they want to, yeah, they want to get in that inner circle, and that's how they come in. Their intentions are good, I have to say. It's like me sharing a, a nice, you know, glass of wine with you with a beautiful bottle that's been around for 30 years, you know. I understand where that comes from. Satan comes as an angel of light to deceive. Yes. Absolutely. So, <laughs> and when, you're, when you're that young, and I came from, you know, and I love my parents, and they're both passed away, but I, I came from a very dysfunctional family, the typical story, and uh, all the stuff that comes along with that. So, yeah, I, I went out there, I got thrown in the world of rock and roll and touring uh, with no tools, you know, and I had a little bit of spiritual connection because of my grandma, and I used to pray a lot and read the Bible here and there to kind of, but it wasn't strong enough, you know. I had to live and experience the bad side, the dark side, in order for me to appreciate what it is today. And I really feel that, that I'm a better person for it today. I have a different perspective on life and what things are important, Eric, like, like you say. And music is a cherry on top, you know. I think as musicians, not to get deep, and that's another interview, as musicians we have a responsibility to, you know, to, to uh, deliver messages that are positive, that are optimistic, that there's hope, that there's faith, that there's light. Because that's what music is, in my mind. And a lot of these cats that go to the dark side, that's fine. We need to have that too. It's like art. You need to be able to separate. This is the dark side and this is the light one. And sometimes we need to see that side to recognize the, the right side. So, art. If you're being artistic, we all have a dark side. I do. And I'm still aware of it. I try not to tap into it uh, too much. Sometimes it kind of takes over, and I, but now I have the tools. I know what to do. So, um, yeah, that's what's going on then in my life, man. But sobriety is everything to me. And uh, uh, I carry that flag proudly and with honor. And, you know, and anybody that wants to uh, have that discussion with me about why I should have a drink or a smoke or a pill or a hit or whatever, 
I'm ready for it. And I'll tell you my story. And we've only touched a little bit on what happened then. There was some freaky stuff that went on in my life. Freaky. And that's why it's good for me to talk about it. Because I'm very grateful. Very grateful. And I know I use that word a lot, but I mean it from my heart. You know? I wake up every morning, man, and it's all about grabbing the bass and singing and playing with all these cats. That's my life. Yeah. You know? And that's the high. That's the real high. That's a testimony. That's a, what it is. That's what life's about. Yeah, that's the real high. Absolutely. And it's all under no influence of any mind-altering stuff. So for me, it's, it's happening. Well, Marco, thanks for sharing, pleasure, sharing this information with us. I'm glad we came across, bro. And let the people know what's out there, what you got going on in the immediate future immediate future i this is saturday next saturday i will be flying to australia sydney to play with this band the dead daisies which consists of uh, richard fortis from guns and roses desi reed from guns and roses wow. yeah uh wow. john stevens from uh, uh in excess singing i'm a big fan of his singing uh, david lowry and guitar myself and uh i'm just coming on drums I think I'll, I'll get more information here as it comes, but uh, a great bunch of cats, great music. I got to tour with them last year, supporting Aerosmith in Australia. I know. And it was a blast. We all hit it off, and uh, there's something brewing there that I can't put my finger on it, and we all know it. We all recognize it, and it's a beautiful thing. Then we ended up uh, get invited to uh, do uh, some touring in the U.S. The Uproar, Rockstar Uproar tour with Alice in Chains, Chains Addiction, and uh, Walking Papers stuff. McKagan's band, great band. So we had a blast. We did the U.S. and Canada, and uh, so we're. I'm going back, and uh, we're gonna have a blast. We have some new songs, some writing going on, some recording. The Dead Daisies. The Dead Daisies. The Dead Daisies as. The dead flower. How would you, having all these fantastic uh, accomplished musicians in this band, what is your sound like? Go check it out. I, it's, can't I, I, it. I can't describe it, but to me, it, it's reminiscent of 70s R&B based rock and roll. Really? Yes. And with John, uh, you know, blowing, he's your point guy. Your singer's your point guy, you know. Um, Amazing. I'm a big fan. I, I sing a little bit. I'm a big fan of singers. I've had, you know, uh, I've had uh, some great opportunities with some great cats. Uh, and uh, he's one of the one of the cats, man. He's just unbelievable. Great singer. His heart, his spirit, who he is as a person reflects on his art. And I'm a big fan of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who's, 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 uh, who's writing the lyrics? Uh, John. Um, but I gotta say, we all contributed there. Uh, Dizzy, John, and myself sat down and we did three tracks, and uh, uh, and he gladly opened the door. So he's one of those guys that understands creativity comes from everywhere. Because when you're in a room with those people, you, it's like being plugged in. Yes, exactly. And knowing the difference and being open is what is important, I think. And some of us don't know how to do that. We do this, we close, this is no, this is what I do, let me do what I do and don't touch it. That's fine, I respect that too. But I think in music in general, creativity comes, you don't know where it's coming from. And my opinion is open the door, let it come in, it doesn't matter who, who's channeling that energy, lyrics, music, melody, let it happen. And I guarantee you, if you get out of the way, something cool will happen. It might not be the best, but it will be cool. You know what I mean? Well, with that, Marco yes, Mendoza, yes, you are the man. Thank, Thank you. you for all the awesome years and keeping up the good work. Thank you, Eric. And go to MarcoMendoza.com. A lot of updates and all that stuff, all right? You got it. Okay, babe. Blaring out with Eric Blair show at NAMM 2014 with Marco Mendoza signing off. Ciao. Show.